Time to meet the men from the ministry. We present Richard Murdoch and Derek Guyler in The Men from the Ministry, a weekly tribute to the men of our government service. Resolute men, each of whom stands firm in any argument, for he knows he has a point. And when he takes his bowler hat off, you can see it. Over now to the General Assistance Department, where that eager young executive, Richard Lamb, has some astonishing information for Secretary Mildred Murphy. Mildred, do you realise that already today I've blinked over a thousand times, grown my fingernails at least one three hundredths of an inch, and taken more than twelve thousand breaths? Poor Mr. Lamb, no wonder you're tired out. <laughs> Here, I'll fetch you a cup of tea. No, don't go yet, Mildred. Did you know that the human body's principal ingredient is water? Well, set my dad, is principal ingredients beer? <laughs> what is that book you're reading? First Aid Hints for Civil Servants. Oh, so that's where it's got to. It's a jolly useful book, Mildred. It was more useful where it was, propping up the window in the washroom. <laughs> Did you know brandy is very good for snake bite? Oh, yeah. Mr Lennox Brown says that's why he keeps plenty in the first aid box. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, he's not likely to get bitten by a snake in Whitehall. He drinks some brandy every day, so if it does happen, he's prepared. <laughs> yeah, what's that page you're on now? Uh, it's headed, How to Combat Strain Due to Overwork in the Civil Service. What's it say? It says, This is a very rare malady. <laughs> in the unlikely event of anyone being struck down by it, check that they are not doing a second job at nights. <laughs> Sheep. Uh, this page is... Uh, oh, no, don't look at this picture, Mildred. I didn't know it was that sort of book. Mr Lamb, it's only illustrating the kiss alive. Oh. <laughs> ah, that explains it. Explains what? I saw the permanent undersecretary giving it to Miss Bentwater from the typing pool after the office park. <laughs> oh? Yeah, I nearly tripped over them near the car park. <laughs> oh, Sir Gregory was very annoyed. When he cooled down, he said Miss Bentwater had a nasty shock and he was giving her the kiss of life. I can imagine. Here, look at this picture, Mr Lamb. Eh? Poor man, all thin and scraggy. Oh, what a shocking sight. What on earth could be wrong with him? On his last legs, by the look of him. Just a minute, Mildred, that's a picture of me on the beach at Brighton. <laughs> It's a snap you took on the staff outing. Oh, yeah, you must have put it in as a bookmark. You know, the trouble with these medical books, they make you feel you've got all the diseases they describe, don't they? <laughs> if you had all the complaints in this book, you'd look like... Well, I don't know what you'd look like. Morning, two. Morning, Mildred. Oh, perhaps I do, though, then. <laughs> <laughs> Morning, one. Ah, let's get down to the day's routine. I don't like wasting precious government time. Righty ho sir. Three lumps for me, Mildred, and don't spill it in the saucer. I'll do me best, sir. You look worried, one. We're facing something pretty nasty. Oh, dear. You don't mean... I do. Work. Oh. Mm. <laughs> uh, Sir Gregory <coughs> jumped out on me as I was trying to tiptoe past his door. I suppose he's fussing about that Snedfield motorway. Well, he shouted something about £50 million of public money trickling down the drain because we haven't fixed the route. I suppose we'd better have a look at it. Yeah. I picked up a map from his secretary. Oh, good. Well, uh, let's spread it out on your desk, All shall right, we? Put it there. Uh, just move your raffia work. Hope it, be uh, there we are. <laughs> oh, I say, this is an underpopulated area. Plenty of room for a motorway. Not a building in sight. Two. Hmm? You've got the map the wrong way up. <laughs> You're looking at the back of it. <laughs> so I am, silly me. Uh, that makes things more difficult. What are you doing now? Yeah, well, we have to crawl under the map to see it, won't we? <laughs> it's very dark under here. Have you got a torch? So come out of there. Yeah? All we need to do is turn the map over. Oh. Just turn it over. Oh, turn good it over. thinking, man. Ah, that's much simpler. Now, as I remember, there are three possible routes for the motorway. Yeah. Here, yeah. here, yeah. or here. Yeah. What, through that marshland? Marshland? That large brown circle is marshland. No, that large brown circle is where someone stood a wet teacup. <laughs> now, may I continue? Uh, please do. Thank you very much. Now, there are three possible routes, as I said. 
but each involves demolishing a large building. Oh, what fun. I do like to watch those big metal balls crashing into people's walls. Yes, for some reason the owners aren't always so keen, though. <laughs> well, then we do one of those compulsory purchase keepers where we give them an eighth of the market price and a framed picture of the Prime Minister. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid that's what it'll come down to. But first we must see if they'll agree to move. Better for the image, you know, if it's voluntary. Which building has to go? Ah, now that's what we've got to decide. Now, this first route, you see, means knocking down a girls' school, St. Hernia's. Oh. <laughs> that would cause some problems. Yes, I had a note from the Ministry of Education yesterday. Did you? Yes, it said, lay off our schools or you'll get done. <laughs> they always did put things rather pithily. <laughs> Uh, what about the second route uh, through this place called Arcadia Park? Yes, well, I gather there's some sort of holiday camp there. Chucking them out would mean bad publicity. So it's got to be this last one. Mm. Yep. But that's Lord Stilton's place. We can't kick his country seat about. <laughs> and why not, pray? Just because he's a lord, he won't get preferential treatment here, you know. Mm. He's an idle layabout, by all accounts, like the rest of our chinless aristocracy. Yes, oh, we push the road through there. Yeah. Uh, getting on with the job at last, you two. About time, I must say. Good morning, Sir Gregory. Uh, morning. We've settled on the route for the motorway. Good, good. Put it in hand at once. Yeah, yes, indeed, Sir Gregory. Uh, yes. One tiny point, Lennox Brown. Yes, on no account must the motorway touch Lord Stilton's estate. His land must not, repeat not, be tampered with. Oh, but that's what we've decided. What? Uh, we've decided not to, to tamper with Lord Stilton's seat. <laughs> oh, my word, now. No. Uh, sound judgment, Lennox Brown. Yes. One of England's oldest families. Well, two of our oldest families, actually. Is that so? Yes, the Shropshire Burks married into the Wiltshire Wrights in the 17th century. The Stilton family is the result. They're right Burks. You know. I can imagine. Well, I'm glad you anticipated my wishes, Lennox Brown. There are people who criticise the aristocracy. Yeah, oh, not me, Sir Gregory. Oh, no, no. Backbone of the nation, in my view. Uh, splendid type. Splendid type, Lord Stilton. But you just said he was an idol. An idol, yes. Uh, uh, I told Lamb, yes. Uh, I said he was uh, an idol of mine. Oh, good, yes. good, yes. I was at school with Pongo Stilton, you know. Oh, yes, sir. Never passed a single exam. Burnt down the gym on boat race night. Grand chap. Dive, <laughs> Joe. Well, now, I want final details of this motorway as soon as possible. Got the transport minister breathing down my neck. No damn patience, these people. So get on with it. Oh, yes, Sir Gregory. Yeah, certainly, uh, Sir Gregory. Will goodbye, you. Sir Gregory. Oh, he's gone. Here we are. Tea up. Oh, good. Is it spilt in the saucer this time? No, sir. Oh, well done. Yes. How did you manage that? Haven't used saucers, have I? <laughs> I've spilt it straight onto the tray. Oh, <laughs> Mildred, we will be out this afternoon. Early start to the weekend, eh? No, no, no. This is official business. Oh. Mr Lamb and I have to go down to Surrey to sort out this motorway affair. Have you settled on the route, then? Uh, not quite. No, no. We are going to put it through Lord Stilton's estate, you see, but it turns out that he's a chum of Sir Gregory's. Yeah. Oh, he can trace his family tree right back to the time his family lived in it. <laughs> so it'll just have to go through that girl's school. We must go down and see if they'll agree to sell. Uh, shouldn't we try Arcadia Park first? No, I don't think so. Some of these holiday camp bosses can be pretty tough, you know. I don't fancy tangling with them. Ah, uh, good point. Uh, we shouldn't have much trouble with the girl's headmistress. Well, go easy on her, sir. She's probably a poor little white-haired old lady. I think you can rely on me to deal with the matter humanely. Order of a ministry car, would you, Mildred? And uh, find us some details about the place. Right, sir. Now, we must get down there straight away. Rather a lovely old building, don't you think? Ideal for demolition. <laughs> Ring the bell, will you? Hmm? You pull that thing there. Pull oh, uh, yeah. right, old one. Uh, don't be too hard on the headmistress, will you? We mustn't bully her. Uh, she is the weaker sex, you know. Two, I'll deal with this. Don't try to teach me my business. I've handled mistresses before, you know. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Yes. Someone's coming. Good afternoon, madam. No hawkers, no seculars. Didn't you read the notice? I have a dog, you know. I don't want to have to set him loose. <laughs> Down, Henry. Down, fellow. I say, what a monster. Look at those teeth. <laughs> and the dog looks ferocious, too. <laughs> now then, madam, we, uh, we would like a word, please, with uh, the headmistress. I am the headmistress. Oh, indeed. Yes, well, then you're uh, Miss Gladys Scrimshank. 
You know my name? Uh, yes, Mildred told me. Your little girl told you? Uh, oh, I see. Then you may come in. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. After you, too. Uh, no, not you. No, nice doggy. Good dog, Henry. Darn Henry. He thought you were an intruder, you see. Yes. Well, uh, uh, I know I'm not an intruder, and you know I'm not an intruder, but how can we convince him? Perhaps if you stop trying to clamber up the grandfather clock. <laughs> yes, come down too, will you? Miss Grimshank, St. Hernia's is a lovely old school. A gem of British architectural history, <laughs> our art mistress tells me. Henry Tudor, you know. I'm not surprised. He's a very fierce dog. <laughs> Mildred is your little girl. Well, uh, our little girl. Yes, uh, his and mine, seem. Yes. I don't quite understand. Well, at the moment, she'll be getting stripped for Jim. Mildred? She doesn't know anyone called Jim. <laughs> we left her typing in the office. Yes. There's some confusion here. You mean you're not parents or guardians? Oh, good heavens, no, madam, no. I'm afraid I jumped to conclusions. I've been very much on the alert recently. We had intruders in our grounds a few weeks ago. Oh, dear me. Dear we me. thought they were burglars, but it turned out they were something worse. Really? What were they? Snoopers from the Ministry of Transport. <laughs> surveying the area, they said. As they might have to build a motorway here. Imagine, a motorway. Think of it. Uh, yes, we did. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, we can. I dealt with them by George. That's why I keep that shotgun on my desk and my guard dog with me all the time. Yes, I see. <clears throat> By heaven, if they so much as take one step inside the front gates, I'll, I'll have their ears for ashtrays. <laughs> now then, gentlemen, if you're not parents, what are you here for? Uh, you tell her to. Yeah, yeah. Me? Uh, no, I, I can't. Uh, you know all the details. Yes, but you explain them much more clearly. Yes, but Don't you, beat I... about the bushman. I can't bear shilly-shallying. Uh, quite right, madam. Oh, quite right, yes. Well, to put it bluntly, in a nutshell, uh, quite briefly, uh, I'll state, uh, frankly, here and now, uh, that... Uh... We're going to buy your school, knock it down, bulldoze to the grounds, <laughs> and build a motorway through here. What? <laughs> What did you say? Let's get out of here, too. She's going for the shotgun. Oh, yes. Yeah. Wait for me, one. The dog's tearing my brolly to pieces. Well, better your brolly than your, your leg. Come on, hurry up. This way, across the lawn. The car's waiting at the gates. She's coming out. She's aiming at us. Take cover. No, keep going. You haven't heard the end of this, madam. Oh, there'll be a report. Oh. <laughs> She's got me. I've been hit. Where? Right in the bottom of my briefcase. Oh. <laughs> Pull yourself together, too. She didn't hurt you, did she? She riddled my briefcase, one. There's lead shot all through my sardine sandwiches. <laughs> well, you always liked them well peppered. <laughs> no laughing matter. We daren't go back there again. If these Arcadia Park people won't cooperate, we've had it. Well, ring the bell, then. Oh. They're odd places, these holiday camps, aren't they? Hmm. Yeah, Mildred spent a week in one last summer, you remember? Yes, yeah, she said some shocking things went on in the chalets at night. Yeah, so I gather. She's going back this year for a fortnight. <laughs> can I, uh, Can I help you, gentlemen? Good heavens. Good gracious. Uh, can I help you? Uh, yes. Uh, we're from the Ministry. The Ministry? Oh, yes. Yes, well, we'd rather like to speak to someone... In authority, please. Oh, yes, the supervisor, Mr. Seymour, you mean? Yes, he'll do. Well, come in, gentlemen. You may wait in the hall. Oh, thank you. I'll fetch him. I shall be a moment. Two. Hmm? Did you notice something odd about that, chap? <laughs> no, I didn't see anything unusual about him. But, but you, you can't say that. He was in the nude. He didn't have a stitch of clothing on, not a stitch. Oh, I noticed that. Well, <laughs> but there was nothing actually unusual about him, was there? I mean, like two, uh, uh, well, uh, <laughs> two big toes on his left foot or something like that. What are you rambling about, two? Well, I, I, well, a chap answers the door to two complete strangers and he's absolutely stark. It, 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 it's an outrage. It is odd, I agree. I'd say it's best to ignore it. Ah, oh, hello. Welcome to Arcadia Park. I'm the supervisor. He hasn't got any clothes on either. 
I had noticed. Uh, my name's Seymour, gentlemen. <laughs> That's very appropriate, yes. Well, I do hope we haven't arrived at an opportune moment, Mr. Seymour. I see you're just out of the bath. <laughs> do you mean? I've been doing my keep fit exercises and the one, two, three, up, down, two, three, two. Yes, yes, well, don't keep jumping up and down like that, Mr. Seymour. It's very disturbing. <laughs> Shall we wait while you put some clothes on? And the one, two, three. Uh, did you say clothes? Oh, at Arcadia Park, that is a forbidden six-letter word. Forbidden? Yes, didn't you know? Good gracious, this is a nudist colony. Oh, I thought it was a holiday camp. No, we don't advertise for fear of attracting undesirable elements, you see. We don't want any cranks here. <laughs> and a one, two, three, one, two, three, up, down, two, three. Yes, I see, Mr. Yes. We keep pretty quiet, you know. Don't want any fuss from the neighbours. Lord Stilton lives next door, and if he knew we were nudists, he might interfere with our amenities. <laughs> Do you want to join our happy throng? We have plenty of sport, you know. The ladies are playing ping pong, as you can see through the window. Oh, oh. Yes, things are really jumping here. <laughs> don't look, too. don't look, don't look. He boggles very easily, you know. Really? Yes. Uh, Mr. Seymour, we are here to negotiate buying this property, you see, for the government. Oh, then I'm afraid I can't help you. Oh, no, no. You'll have to speak to the owner. He's upstairs warming the lino for tonight's dance. <laughs> yes, well, we would like to see him, please. Uh, what's his name, by the way? Ivor Winterbottom. <laughs> Ivor Winterbottom? He's a cold, stern man. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> He may not be averse to selling the property. We have thought of moving to sunnier climes. Um, just take your clothes off and step this way. No, oh, I know beg your pardon. No, 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 I'm afraid you must undress. What? It's the first rule of Arcadia Park. Mr. Winterbottom won't see anyone unless they're unadorned. He gets terribly embarrassed if he sees anyone in clothes. Uh, just slip your things off and hang them up. I'm afraid that is quite out of the question. I shan't even take my gloves off. Well, suit yourselves, gentlemen, but you can't talk business here unless you follow the rules. Let's go, too. Let's go. I, oh, dear, I, I need the weekend to think about this. Oh, what happened then? Hmm. I wasn't going to strip. Not with my scruples. <laughs> And, of course, we hadn't the heart to take over that school, you know. And the poor old headmistress was down on her knees, pleading with us. Well, she went. Oh, shut up, shut up. <laughs> yes, I was worried all the weekend. Oh, Lennox Brown. Oh. And don't try to creep up the chimney, Lamb. I want to see you, too. Oh, what a pleasant surprise, Sir Gregory. No, I've heard nothing more about that motorway. Which building was it you decided to demolish? Well, uh, you tell Sir Gregory, too. Go on. Well, you see, Henry had my umbrella and my sardine sandwiches were full of lead and she thought we were Mildred's parents and I wouldn't take my trousers off to see Windsor Boss. Lamb! <laughs> What are, you, what are you dribbling about? Oh, you... Look, take no notice, Sir Gregory. He's been drinking on an empty head. <laughs> Rest assured, Sir Gregory, this motorway is in hand, and you'll shortly have our report. I'd better. Yes. I'll be at Pongo Stilton's party tonight. I had hoped to tell him what's happening. He takes a keen interest in local affairs. As it is, I'll promise he'll hear tomorrow. So get on with it. <laughs> Oh, dear. What are we going to do? Well, if Lord Stilton's out and the school's out, she'll have to go back to the nudists. They're not unwilling to sell. But we can't fix it without taking our clothes off. It'll only be for a few minutes. Oh, very well. I suppose we've got no choice. All right, two. We'll have to strip. Oh, all right. Oh. Not here, two. Oh. Not here. <laughs> Wait till we get down there, ma'am. Well, it's got to be done by tomorrow, so you'll have to go this evening. And there's no ministry cars after six. We'll go by train, Mildred. Just as long as we get it over. <laughs> don't fuss, too. Yes, don't, fu yes. don't fuss. Much less embarrassing stripping out here in the shrubbery. <laughs> Save that chap making us undress in the hall. But I just stepped back in a holly bush. <laughs> It's jolly chilly with nothing on. Be thankful it's summer. Still, better keep our bowler hats on and carry our umbrellas. <laughs> yes, we don't want to look ridiculous. Right. Now, are you ready to? Yeah. Oh, yes, I can see you are. Yes. Right. 
Well, we'll uh, nip across the lawn. Right. The house looks rather different in the dark. Where's the front door? Never mind. I don't fancy my bare feet on that doorstep. Those French windows are open and the lights are on. You mean we walk straight into the room? Yes, yes, yes. And don't be nervous, don't be nervous. And remember, everyone else will be naked too. Aye. Now, come along. Be bold. Yes. I'm glad you got away from Whitehall for our little party, Gregory. Uh, glad to be here, Bongo. And it doesn't look very little to me. <laughs> Isn't that the Lord Chancellor over there? The one sharing the crisps with the Archbishop? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> oh, and I see the, the, the Prime Minister's just come in. Oh, yes, well, I had to invite him for appearances' sake, you know. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, here's my wife. Hi. My dear, have you met uh, my old school chum, Gregory Pitkin? Uh, Bunny Pitkin, we used to call him. <laughs> oh, how do you do? I've heard so much about oh, you. Oh, I, I hope you didn't believe it, what? <laughs> well, how do you do, ladies, Stilton? <laughs> yes, uh, Bunny... <laughs> Uh, Bunny is one of these Whitehall wallers. Yeah. He's making sure this infernal motorway doesn't touch our land. Oh, jolly good. Yeah. I say, isn't it rather warm in here? Yeah, it is rather. I'm so glad we opened the French windows. I... Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, no! Uh, something wrong, Lady Stilton? What is it, my dear? You've gone quite white. What? 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 Over there! Two men coming through the windows! <laughs> And they're both stark naked! Oh, oh, oh. oh, good evening, everyone. Here we are again. I have been to Bottom. Uh, where is he? Yeah, we've come to show him our proposals. Oh! Dennis Brown! Oh, my word, you're here, Sir Gregory. Oh, well, I didn't know you were a new disciple. <laughs> do, do you know these people, Gregory? Uh, no, 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 not at all. Lennox Brown, get out of here at once! Uh, shall I stay, Sir Gregory? Uh, Odd we're the only ones in the news. Oh, well, so we are. Get out! Go! Go now! There's no need to push it, Greg. If we we'll go if you want us to. You know. Get out this way, quick! Out into the garden! You'll hang for this! Uh, uh, please, for please carry on, everyone, as if nothing had happened. Just, just a couple of hippies from London. That's all. <laughs> I've never heard such a half-baked story. How could you mistake the house? And stop scrambling around in the bushes when I'm talking to you. We're trying to find our clothes, Sir Gregory. <laughs> I'm sure it was these bushes we changed in. That holly made a distinct impression on me. <laughs> that hernia woman won't budge for the motorway, so we must have Arcadia Park. And they won't talk unless you're naked. I know you told yes, me. Well... But you're both naked now. And Arcadia Park is over there. So go and get it settled. No, Sir Gregory. I've had enough. That was an order, Lennox Brown. I'm sorry, sir. I'd rather resign. You don't know what it's like running around naked in public. Well, well, it looked hideous just now. <laughs> but in a nudist colony, it's nothing. Go to Arcadia Park and get this over. Lord Stilton's impatient and he's a powerful man, I tell you. Gregory, are you out there? I want a word with you. Oh, good Lord, what a mess. Go to Arcadia Park, you two. Do as I say. I'm sorry. No, 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 you must go. No, look, be... look, look. I'll come there with you. But you'd have to strip too. I'm aware of that. We've no option. We must get this business settled. Oh, and here's my jacket, Lennox oh, Brown. Well, come well, on. Come on, lamb. Take right. my socks. Oh, Go no, on, no, they no, won't bite yes, you. The sooner we get this done, the better. Mind those nettles, Sir Gregory. Ah! Oh! Oh! Well, what do you say, Lamb? What do you say? Doesn't matter now. Uh, yes, this is the right building. I recognise it. Okay. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Better make sure this time there's a notice board there. Oh, have you any matches, Sir Gregory? Well, of course not, you oh. fool. <laughs> I've got any pockets. No, no. It's all right. I can see by the moonlight. It says Arcadia Park, all right. Yeah, well, now keep out of the moonlight till we reach the front door. We don't want anyone seeing us naked except the nudists themselves. Very good, Sir Gregory, yes. You lead the way, sir. <laughs> Hello, my dear. Gladys here. Yes, Gladys Scrimshank, St. Hernia School. I rang to say we've moved premises over the weekend. Yes, the whole school. What? No, quite near. A place called Arcadia Park. <laughs> some sort of holiday camp, I think. They wanted to sell, so I grabbed it quickly. There's some talk of a motorway through our old place. All the girls like it here. I've arranged a little treat for them this evening. There's an amateur pop group coming up from the village. I think they're at the door now. I'll ring you tomorrow for a longer chat. Goodbye. Miss Harricot, 
Are the girls all assembled by the front door? Yes, Miss Scrimshank. Uh, oh, so they are. Good. Now, attention, girls. I have a little surprise for you. <laughs> all right, I'm coming. No, I'll open the door, Miss Harrigan. This will be a treat for you, too. I know how you like this. <laughs> now, then. Oh, well, oh, see you. Oh, oh, right. 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 Good heavens! Why has this woman got her clothes on? Miss <laughs> Harrigan, summon the hockey first eleven and tell them to bring their sticks. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Here is the news read by John Curl. Surrey police are still combing a wide area for the three naked men who knocked on the door of a school near Guildford last night. The men were seen by many people as they ran through the village of Druid's Water, pursued by the school hockey team. The local postmistress said she had never seen anything like it, but emphasised that she was not filing a complaint. As the men fled behind a row of houses, there were several 999 calls from residents who thought they had fairies at the bottom of their garden. <laughs> and now the rest of the news. The missing civil servants. There is still no trace of Sir Gregory Pitkin and two other ministry officials who disappeared yesterday. But men working on the new Snedfield motorway today found black jackets and pinstriped trousers hidden among some bushes. Police think these belong to the missing men and say they cannot rule out foul play, especially as a briefcase found nearby contained sardine sandwiches riddled with gunshots. Oh, what a carry-on, Mr. Lang. I thought we'd never see London again. Imagine a fortnight in the Surrey woods living on berries and nuts. I wonder you didn't freeze to death. We finally got clothes off some scarecrows. That's when we started to hike back to town. You must have looked aside. Yes. Still, people took pity and gave us things. Gave you things? Yeah, I was given a meat pie and a pair of old shoes. I ate the lot. <laughs> Mr. Lennox Brown got two foreign coins and a bar of soap. Well, it's nice to have you back. But what's going to happen now? Goodness knows, Mildred. Lucky Sir Gregory was with us. He can pull a few strings. Mr. LB's seeing him now. Oh. Pot a tea, Mildred, and make it nice and strong. Righty-ho, sir. How'd it go? Ah, well, I think we'll be all right. Sir Gregory's convinced everyone we were off on a secret mission. No one connects us with the three nude madmen. Well, what about the motorway one? Ah, well, Lord Stilton's decided to leave Surrey. Says the place is going to the dogs. You mean he's cheesed off? <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> rather good then. I, I like it. Like it. Like yes, it. so you see, the road can go through his estate after all. Uh, then it all worked out rather well. Ah, well, now, just a moment. There's just one little snag. Oh, what's that, then? Well, having seen us as nature intended, yes. Sir Gregory thinks we're not fit enough. <laughs> yes, he's put us down for the civil service early morning physical training course starting 7 a.m. tomorrow. Oh, no. Yes. Oh. 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 Bearing up as the men from the ministry were Richard Murdoch and Derek Guyler. Also featured were Ronald Baddeley, Norma Ronald, John Graham and Joan Sanderson. The programme was written by Edward Taylor and John Graham and produced by Edward Taylor. The men from the ministry.
Join us for more Low Notes in High Places with Norma Ronald, Ronald Baddeley, John Graham and the men from the ministry, Richard Murdoch and Derek Guiler. <laughs> At the Ministry, top brains stand by to tackle the nation's problems. Sometimes, of course, they meet frustration. You seem restless, one. Well, there's a lot to be done, and I can't get on till Mildred brings me the necessary papers. See. Here we are, sir. I brought the papers you wanted. Ah. They're all there. Racing Gazette, Jockey's Journal and the Bookie Basher. <laughs> Splendid. Now, let's see today's horses, shall we? Uh, ah. Au pair girl is strongly fancied. <laughs> Fishmonger should be good for a place. They do call these horses funny names. You should hear what the losers call them. Mildred, type out the runners I've ticked and I'll give you my final choice letter. Righty ho, sir. Only it will come out faint. Hmm? My typewriter ribbon's worn out. Well, we can't afford a new one. You'll have to rub your mascara on it like last time. <laughs> oh, and I suppose when the paper clips run out, I'll be using my air pins again. Money today is like Tom Jones's trousers. Very tight. <laughs> Quite a lot left in our petty cash account. I looked in the book this morning. Really? Mm. I say, I say, that is good news. And it's almost the end of the financial year. Oh, Sir Gregory will be pleased. It's <laughs> about time. He's been awfully bad-tempered lately. Ah, oh, I want a word with you two. Good morning, Sir Grumpy. <laughs> well, how are you, sir, this lovely morning? And your dear lady wife? Oh, be well? quiet, uh, Lennox Brown. Oh. It's the 1st of March today. By Jove, how time flies. Yes, better tear that sheet off the calendar, too. Pity, though, you know. I rather like the young lady in the bubble bath. <laughs> I thought you did. That page is August 1960. No! <laughs> Stop chattering, you two! It's the 1st of March, nearly the end of the financial year. Oh, yes, well, now, we were just talking about that, Sir Gregory. Yeah. And we've got some good news for you. Yes. I doubt it, Lamb. I really doubt it. It's true, Sir Gregory. We've got some surplus money in our petty cash account. I'm not sure how much, but we'll show you the books. I've seen the books. You've exactly 89 pounds and 50 pence. Isn't it good about this surplus? Eh? No, it is not good. Oh, not uh, even slightly good? It's very bad. That's why I'm here, man. You know how the government works. If you don't spend your whole allocation, that proves you don't need so much. So next year, they give you less. Oh, dear. <laughs> if that £89 isn't spent, and spent quickly, this department's budget will suffer. I see. Then we've got to get rid of this money. At last. <laughs> Sometimes I'd swear he understands what we're saying. <laughs> yes, get rid of the money. I want your cash account empty by April 5. Oh, uh, fancy that. 89 pounds. Why have we got so much? Well, it may be partly my fault. Oh, glory. <laughs> we were due for a new office typewriter, you see, weren't we? But I thought we had to economise. So you didn't buy one? No, I borrowed my nephew's toy typewriter. <laughs> a toy typewriter? Good grief. Well, that explains it. I've been wondering why it played Bar Bar Black Sheep when I <laughs> paper oh, Sorry, Mildred, I was only trying to help. Oh, never mind, Mr Lamb. I'll go and make you a nice cup of tea. Oh, thanks. It's no use being sorry. I mean, we must find ways of spending this £89. I've thought of the answer already. We'll have a party. Uh, you can't waste that cash on a party. It's public money. But the Ministry's been wasting public money for years. <laughs> <laughs> but that's different. We're allowed to waste public money as long as we don't enjoy it. <laughs> but we must never use it to our own advantage. Oh, then, how can we get rid of this surplus? I'll get the account book and file. Put it all on my whatnot, my cabinet. I'm off to lunch at the club. What did you say, one? I said put it all on my whatnot. I'll have a look at it later. <laughs> Quick lunch today. I'll be back about four. <laughs> we should spend that money on essentials, like a new electric kettle. Here's your cuppa, Mr Lamb. Here, what does Mr Lennox Brown want us to do with that money? Oh, he doesn't seem to care. Too worried about his lunch. He said, put it all on my whatnot and walked out. Well, that's a sure way to lose it. Especially with his choice of horses. Horses? What's he got to do with horses? My whatnot's a horse. I mean, I saw it in his racing paper. Running in the 330. A hundred to one outsider. Oh, I didn't realise. Then he wants us to put money on that. 
I suppose it's a good idea. I mean, Sir Gregory said to get rid of it. I'll write a cheque for £89 on our petty cash account. <laughs> and I'll take it round to the betting shop. We can listen to the race on the radio. Yeah, and wave goodbye to that £89. <laughs> My whatnot's got as much chance of winning as I have of being Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> Well, it's a very fast race so far. Lovely Lady is pushing out in front, and this, I may say, is very exciting indeed. Lovely Lady, closely followed by Gay Bachelor. Gay Bachelor and Au Pair Girls a little behind. Lovely Lady running superbly, not at all worried by Gay Bachelor. And here comes Father's Dream. Father's Dream is neck and neck with Au Pair Girl. In third position. That £89 as good as gone. But Lovely Lady's flagging now, and yes, yes, it's Gay Bachelor on the turn. And good gracious, what's this? Coming up very fast indeed. Yes, it's my whatnot. Oh, not my whatnot. <laughs> yes. Yes, my whatnot. My whatnot's up on the rails now. This is really quite something to see. And my whatnot hasn't had an airing for quite a while now. <laughs> Seems remarkably lively this afternoon. I thought you said it wouldn't stand a chance. I thought my whatnot wouldn't stand a chance with Lovely Lady, but I was wrong. Lovely Lady's clearly worried by my whatnot. <laughs> so's Gay Bachelor. And my whatnot is right out in front now. The crowd are amazed. And yes, at the post, it's my whatnot. My whatnot, Gay Bachelor and Au Pair Girl. Blimey, it's been and gone and won. Yes, my whatnot has won easily at a hundred to one. This has been a great surprise to a lot of us. You can say that again. A great surprise. Oh, I'll switch it off. You know what this means, don't you? It means you'll be the first archbishop in the miniskirt. <laughs> At a hundred to one. We've got about 9,000. No, but uh, I mean, what will she get? It's uh, no it's use frothing like at the old. mouth. We've got to keep our cool. Hello, Bunch. I'm back from lunch. I've <laughs> 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 rather an impudent little claret with my... Two. What's the matter? You're all white and bobbly like the canteen blancmange. <laughs> <laughs> the petty cash surplus. We put it on that horse like you said. Like I said, I did nothing of the sort. But you had a bet, did you? Come on, hoping to lose the lot. And now it's one at a hundred to one. Nine thousand pounds. Sir Gregory will go mad. I suppose we'll just have to keep the winnings ourselves. I shall pretend I didn't hear that. <laughs> Money won by the petty cash account belongs to that account, and we cannot use one penny of the petty cash account for our own ends. It would be immoral, unethical, and worse. Worse? We might get caught. <laughs> but what about the surplus? Well, the answer's simple. We just don't collect the winnings. No, no, no. And we'll have lost the original £89. You, say. you are clever, Mr Lennox Brown. But can we do that? Well, of course we can. Of course we can. Bookies don't force the money on you. Oh, Good it? gracious. General Assistance Department. Flutters here. Tote Investment Operatives. Oh, the betting shop. May I be the first to congratulate you on your great win... Your cheque is now in the post. You'll have it first thing in the morning. He's sent off the cheque already. All part of the service of Flutters. No need to collect. We send you a cheque. <laughs> Goodbye, sir. And please invest with us again. Oh, dear. You would, wouldn't you? You not only make this daft bet, you have to choose London's only lunatic bookie. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do, sir? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm going home. We have a busy day tomorrow. Have we? Well, you remember, too. We're seeing some writer for the Arts Council. But what can we do with that money? I'll sleep on it, too. The cheque arrived this morning, one. £9,000 to get rid of. I had a brilliant idea last night, too. This playwright we're seeing, Arthur Whisker, his name is. Now, he wants a grant to put on his new play. Yes, yes, the Arts Council have spent all their money on that exhibition of contemporary soup tins. <laughs> so they can't back his play, and we've got the job of telling him, right? But, now listen, but yeah. suppose, suppose we backed it. With our £9,000? Exactly, <laughs> yes. The stuff he writes is bound to lose money. His last play lost a fortune. You mean it didn't run? No, the audience did. <laughs> <laughs> He'll lose our surplus in no time. As long as this new play is down to his usual standard. Mr. Whiskers here, sir, doesn't half look peculiar.
peculiar is wearing a great scruffy fur coat over red jeans and a red vest. He looks like a yak bleeding to death. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, th these artistic people all dress in a way out. Style, Mildred, Cliff Mitchell, Moll, Semprini. They're all the same. Yeah. <laughs> Fetch him in, dear. Righty ho, sir. Uh, this way, Mr. Whisker. Oh, thank you very much, like. Oh, yes, well, uh, sit, sit, sit down, my dear fellow, won't you? Have my chair, Mr. Viscount. Oh, don't bother, don't bother. I always sit on the floor. And uh, you can call me Art. Feel free, like, you know. Oh, yes. Well, now, uh, Art. Yeah? Yes. Uh, you're seeking a grant for your play. Yeah, and before you refuse, like, with your bourgeois excuses, you ought at least to hear about it. My dear chap, we're most anxious to hear about it. Yes. Has it got a title? Yeah. It's called... Garbage. Gab. <laughs> no, good, good. Yeah, very promising. The play's a, a tragedy, see? <laughs> we hoped it might be. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a big social put-down, like, you know. The stage will be covered in mud, representing our decadent society. Mud all over the place, like, you know. Splendid. How many characters in the play? Oh, one. Just one. And he plays the whole thing stuck upside down inside a giant <laughs> Wellington boot. <laughs> Nude, of course. Oh, yes. Audiences are going to hate this. Okay. Uh, yes, well, now, it's just the sort of play we'd hope for, Mr Whisker. There's no words, you see. It's all silent. It's a meditational experience, you see, more than a play. Excellent, excellent, yes. On behalf of the Arts Council, Mr Whisker... We'd be delighted to back this exciting work of art. Are you sure? Well, just to make absolutely sure, uh, Mr. Whisker, why don't you cover the audience in mud? <laughs> as well as the stage, you see. I mean, they can always be hosed down as they leave the theatre. Great! That's just the, the end I was looking for. I was a bit worried, you see, about finishing Goff. Oh, this will finish them off all right. <laughs> Yes, of course. Throw mud yeah, all yeah. over the audience. Yeah. Why not? There's the check, Mr. Whisker. There's the check. All ready for you. Make sure you take it with you. All right, all right. I can put it in my pocket myself. Get off. Yes. Well, off you go, Art. Uh, Art. And uh, mind you spend every penny. Uh, goodbye, my dear chap. Uh, me, what's going on? Mr. Whisker's play, Mildred. It's going on next week. And coming off the day after, I think. <laughs> One, have you seen the papers? Yes, I read them in the train. Everyone has a front-page story on Whiskers' play. Oh, it's clear the audience loathed it. Look at these headlines. Obscene plays. Prime Minister to act. Yes, and this one here. <laughs> See, this one in my paper, look. Yes. First night riots at Whiskers' play. The audience fought to get out of the theatre as they were covered in mud and drenched with water. Many had left by the end of the seventh act. During the interval, several women complained of the presence of a naked man in the bar and threatened to call the manager. They were told he was the manager. <laughs> oh, dear me. Oh, we've seen the last of that money, too. <laughs> oh, Lennox Brown smirking, uh, speaking. Arts Council here, Antonia Gusset. Good morning, madam. Look, we're very worried about the money you put into this new whisker play. Yes, well, madam, you know, some plays do lose money, don't they? Lose money? This play is making money. What? Well, it, it can't be. Have you seen the headlines in the papers? Never mind the headlines. The critics are raving about it. They call it a breakthrough in modern drama. Harold Hopsack says it hits you like a kick in the groin. I know the feeling. <laughs> rights have been sold, that means there's £50,000 for the backers. That's you, the General Assistance Department. Us? No, no. No, no, we don't want £50,000. We don't want it. No, no, look, it's the Art Council. You have it. Good yeah. heavens, man, the Arts Council mustn't show a profit. It does. I mean, we exist to throw money away. Well, just this once, please. Certainly not. Uh, it's nearly the end of the financial year. I've sent you the cheque for £50,000 already. Goodbye. Two. The play's a hit. Oh. They're sending us fifty thousand pounds. Oh dear. Thank heaven Sir Gregory's not here. What would he say? Ah, oh, there you are. 
We can say no. <clears throat> that 89 pounds in your petty cash account, I take it the situation's changed? Oh, definitely, Sir Gregory. Yes. <laughs> Good. Then it's down to a few shillings now, is it? Uh, well, not exactly, sir, no. It's uh, a little more than that. Right? Well, uh, what is the balance? The balance uh, in our petty cash account, yes, yes. Uh, to be absolutely frank and honest, stands at £50,000. Stop these silly jokes. <laughs> For a moment, I almost believed you. <laughs> £50,000 in your petty cash account. <laughs> I suppose it is rather funny. <laughs> too late, too late, too. I know it's a little surprising, sir, but we really have got 50000 due to circumstances beyond our control. Good grief. You can't have, can you? We have, Sir Gregory. Isn't it hilarious? <laughs> Lamb! Are you mad? With £50,000 on our books, the whole department's in jeopardy. We, we, we could get merged with a coal board. <laughs> Couldn't we give it to British Rail? Then they could close some more stations. <laughs> this money is not transferable. We've got to lose it ourselves. Lamb, go and tell Miss Murphy to make black coffee. Yeah, black. Lennox Brown and I have some thinking to do. Yeah. That's something you can't help us with. <laughs> oh, very well. Lennox Brown. Yes, sir. There's only one way to lose this kind of money quickly, and that's the stock exchange. By Jove. I know a really terrible firm of stockbrokers. Yes. Man, dabbles and clangs. Oh. <laughs> but they save their worst advice for people who look half-witted. I see, sir. So we send Lamb. Precisely. <laughs> Lamb and them together can lose this sum in a, in a week. Splendid, Sir Gregory, splendid. Good of you to give us a leg up. Well, if Lamb doesn't get rid of that money, he will get a leg up, where it hurts most. <laughs> The stockbroker was most helpful, Sir Gregory. He said to invest the 50,000 in Rockall silver mines. <laughs> Isn't Rockall that lump of stone that tries to look like an island somewhere out in the Atlantic? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yes. <laughs> Not much chance of finding silver there, eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I'm not quite sure what's going on, but have I done the right thing this time? <laughs> Indeed you have, Lamb, yes. We've said goodbye to that surplus 50,000. <laughs> Rockall silver. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> oh, dear, dear, dear. Dear, dear. <laughs> evening paper, Mr. Uh, Alex Brown. All the winners up to four o'clock. Uh, Mildred, don't hand me the racing results before Sir Gregory. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't know he'd want them first. <laughs> Here's the racing results, Sir Gregory. Oh, I don't want them, Miss Murphy. Just a minute, though. What's that headline on the front page? Oh, that's just some dreary story about uranium. Let me see that. No, you hold it. My hands are shaking. Well, sh shall I read it out? Yes. It says, uranium found on rock all. Shares rocket. Hey, I see, sir. <laughs> Shares in rock all silver, who hold all mining concessions, soared dramatically on the stock exchange. In an hour, they rose from 50 pence to 200 pounds each. <laughs> Is that good, Sir Gregory? Oh. No, it can't be. He's turning green again. <laughs> this is disaster. It means the department surplus now stands at 20 million pounds. Oh, <laughs> 20 million pounds in our petty cash account. Perhaps we could buy that new typewriter. Oh, shit. <laughs> but surely the government could use 20 million pounds, Sir Gregory? It would keep things going for several hours. Well, I... <laughs> I've said all along that this money is not transferable. I have... But a sum of this magnitude, sir. Perhaps an internal transfer in government circles. You may be right, Linux Bowers. Yes, yes. But we must keep calm about this. Oh, calm, 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 do you hear? Oh, we are calm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> now we'll go straight to the Treasury yes. and see Sir Jasper Farthing. He's a financial wizard. Yes. <laughs> Let me see. Three plus four are eight, and carry two. Sir Jasper, 
We have this money problem. Three into nine goes four, and <laughs> borrow one. Twenty million pounds, to be exact. Through no fault of mine, I hasten to add. No, do stop chattering, Pitkin. Can't you see I'm busy? I'm totting up the milk bill. <laughs> Six pints a week at five pence each is... Uh... With respect, Sir Jasper, this is urgent. Well, of course it is. That tea lady's overcharging me. She's making too much lolly on the trolley. <laughs> this twenty million pounds, Sir Jasper. Oh, very well. Well, let's deal with your little problem first. Twenty million, you say? Uh, that is the sum, yes. yes. Well, yes. pass my pen and I'll write you a cheque. A bit careless, you know. This will put an extra diddler on the decks. Sir Jasper, we don't want money. We've got twenty million surplus. Oh, oh dear me, this is serious. We'd like to give it to government funds. Oh, no, 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 no. Good gracious, no. Quite out of the question. Why? Why? Because I'd have to start a new page. And I, <laughs> I, I, I can't start a new page at the end of the financial year. Yeah. What can we do with this surplus? Bad housekeeping, Pitkin. Next year, your budget will be cut by 20 million. Look, Sir Jasper, our annual budget's just 200 pounds. Now, this surplus comes from outside profits. Oh, dear. A ministry making a profit? Oh, oh no, we can't have that. No, we, we'll have to do something. Uh, dear me, now, let me think. How did this chap get his job? <laughs> you remember last year... They felt the Treasury needed younger men. Oh, I've got it. I've got it, I, I think. Yes, this money could be shared between departments. Then no one would have a surplus big enough to notice. Ah, good thinking, Sir Jasper, good thinking. Good. <laughs> uh, send all ministries a memo, Lennox Barn. Invite them to add their suggestions. At one, sir, yes. Two, can you take a circular memo? Will it fit in the square envelope? No. Oh. <laughs> Three. Look. Just write this down and send it to all offices. Now, really, general assistance, 20 million underspent. Treasury suggests surplus be divided among all ministries. Have you anything to add? Now, about this milk bill. Morning, Mildred. Morning, sir. Yeah. Oh, good Lord. What's all this mail? Has Mr. Lamb been asking for pen pals again? <laughs> no, sir. It's all from other ministries. After your circular memo. Oh, yes. Suggestions on what to do with our surplus. Yes. Well, there is one suggestion mm. from Mr. Rudge at the Board of Trade. But it doesn't seem physically possible. <laughs> Poor old Rudge. Is it a tricky age? <laughs> Most ministries have just sent us huge cheques. Yes, well, I mean, if we... Cheques? What do you... You mean they've sent us money? Well, you asked them, didn't you? What? In your memo. General assistants have 20 million surplus, you said. Have you anything to add? <laughs> then it's wrong. This is appalling. Thanks to your idiot memo, every other department's dumping their surplus on us. Yeah, but, uh, wait, you mean other departments have surpluses too? Well, apparently, but they all kept quiet because they were afraid their budgets would be cut. There's a cheque for £12 million from the post office. Well, you see, they don't admit to a profit publicly or they couldn't have put their charges up. Look, here's another big one with a note saying, Take this ten million nigger... We ain't half glad to get shot of it. Who's that from? The Ministry of Education. <laughs> yes, they're all at it, you see. This department's petty cash surplus stands at two hundred million pounds. General Assistance Department. Oh. Oh, yes, sir. He's here, sir. It's for you, Sir Gregory, the Prime Minister. Oh, good grief. Hold on. I'll take it in the other office. Uh, Mildred. Sir? How did the PM sound? Well, he seemed a bit cross, sir. Oh. Like that time we were helping the Navy, when Mr Lamb made a mistake and they used his yacht for gunnery practice. <laughs> oh, glory. I think I'll take some leave. Fancy. We're lumbered with £200 million, pounds, then. Uh, could anyone lend me five bob? I promised my landlady some kipper fillets and I'm out of money till payday. Uh, certainly not to. I'm short of cash myself. Uh, <laughs> the government are onto this surplus. The Chancellor's terribly worried. He's just heard from Professor Noddy and Dr. Beggiers. 
Professor Noddy and Dr. Beggy? Yes, the gnomes of Zurich. <laughs> they control the world's purse strings. They've heard of our huge surplus and insist on lending Britain vast sums of money. But that must be good, isn't it? Well, of course it isn't. We've got no real wealth, just masses of paper attracting more masses of paper. Yeah. And with hot money pouring in, our economy could grind to a halt. Oh. What are we going to do? Well, the Prime Minister says people must pull together and spend this money. He'll speak to the nation tonight. <laughs> Here is the news read by John Curl. First, the money crisis. In an emergency broadcast an hour ago, the Prime Minister announced plans to disperse the huge financial surplus which threatens Britain's economy. He said that all current wage claims would be granted, and in most cases trebled, provided that workers agreed to spend the money at once. He urged union leaders to press for further rises and employers to pay them immediately. <laughs> The Prime Minister asked everyone to spend all their savings, and he went on... I'd now like to make it absolutely clear that the British people will, as always, rise to the occasion. We must now loosen our belts and push our horns out. <laughs> the only thing to save for your old age is yourself. First reaction from trade union leaders was hostile. Outside TUC headquarters, Mr. Vic Tickle told our reporter... I can only say that we've been advised to abolish wage restraint and demand as much money as possible. We are naturally greatly concerned about this, as it seems to reduce the opportunity for strike action. <laughs> the president of the amalgamated knockers, Mr. Jack Sprint, described the appeal as a typical Tory trick. He said, if that's what the government wants, it's up to us to oppose it. Shop stewards are assembling in Trafalgar Square to demand wage reductions and longer working hours. <laughs> in a Hornchurch bedding factory, male and female workers plan to be at it all night. <laughs> The government's appeal fell flat. Oh, yes. People are refusing pay rises and prices are falling in the shops. Hot money is piling up. Our surplus is now five billion. And the royal mint's cracked under the strain. Cool. So we've now got a mint with an owl. Maybe it is. Really? It's hot in here, isn't it? Yeah, your cactus has gone all droopy. <laughs> oh, glorious. So it has. Yeah. Maybe it needs some fertiliser. Great news, Lennox Brown. There's no need to worry anymore. But it has gone awfully droopy. We can all relax. I've got the answer. Fertiliser. I... <laughs> what? Well, don't be rude, Lennox Brown. Oh. I'm trying to tell you that the financial crisis is over. You mean we found a way round... Round the surplus? Better than that, we can turn it to our advantage. Really? The PM's done a brilliant deal with the World Bank, and they'll use it to cancel our debts. But that's marvellous. This huge pile of cash we built up is the country's biggest asset. I've done it. I've been at it all night, and I've done it. <laughs> what? To where on earth have you been? The money problem. I've solved it. You've solved it? What do you mean? All those millions of pounds. I've dealt with them. You dealt with them. One or two others helped, and we drew it all out from the banks in 20 pound notes. You drew it all out? Yes. And what did you do with it? We've been down in the boiler room all night. We ah. burnt the lot. Ah. 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 Blimey, so that's why the eating's so high. I think I'll just sit down for a moment. Uh, Sir Gregory, why are you lifting that chair? Aren't you going to congratulate me? Ah, uh, you no, no, you're not, are you? Oh, you are not, are you? Rolling in cash as the men from the ministry were Richard Murdoch and Derek Guyler. Also featured were Norma Ronald, Ronald Baddeley and John Graham. The programme was written by Edward Taylor and John Graham and produced by Edward Taylor.
Time to meet the men from the ministry. You're invited once again to jump aboard the bureaucratic bandwagon with Norma Ronald, Ronald Baddeley, Garrard Green, John Graham and the men from the ministry, Richard Murdoch and Derek Guyler. Our story this week begins not in the hurly-burly of the General Assistance Department, but in more elegant areas of government. Lord Stilton is one of that magic circle who can truly be said to be ruining the country. <laughs> I'm sorry, who can truly be said to be running the country. <laughs> He's sitting in his vast office awaiting a visitor. Sir Gregory Pitkin, sir. Ah, ah, come in, come in, Pitkin. Sit down, my dear fellow. Ah, oh, thank you, sir. Splendid office you have here. I do like your mink carpet. Oh, good, good. We're always on the lookout for new ways of spending public money, you know. <laughs> well, I suppose you're wondering why I sent for you. Well, if it's an earldom or some other recognition of my achievements, then I can only say thank you, Lord Stilton. Of course, I've never asked for promotion, Very but, wise uh... saves disappointment. Oh. As you know, there's to be a big international conference in Paris next week. Ah, yes, yes. Something to do with space, isn't it? Correct. The United Nations is anxious to avoid future squabbles over possession of the various planets. Quite right. Keep the fighting on our own planet where it belongs. Well, man will soon reach Venus. So, next week's conference will allot areas of that planet to all countries who are anxious to bid. Ah, then we must get all we can, eh? No, 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 no. Quite the reverse. Oh. We don't want any part of it. The expense, you see. We can hardly afford to send trains to Birmingham, never mind spaceships to Venus. <laughs> well, right. well, 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 that's what I meant. We, we shan't be putting in a bid. Huh? Well, of course we'll be putting in a bid. Oh. Dear me, dear me, dear me. <laughs> we can't lose face by admitting we don't want it. Our delegates will bid for every section of that planet. But uh, what happens if we get some? Disaster. Apart from the expense, we'd have to sit through another of those TV space shots. Then what's the answer, sir? The answer, Pitkin, is to send to this conference two delegates who are so totally incompetent that although they are seen to be doing their best, they're absolutely guaranteed to fail. Yes. The problem is, where can we find two men who are really and utterly hopeless? No problem there, sir. Oh? I have two men in my department who were born to do this. Indeed? Well, who are they? Lennox Brown and Lamb. Two of my worst men. Lennox Brown started at the top and has worked his way downwards ever since. <laughs> Lamb, on the other hand, has risen without trace. What are their credentials? Well, last week they were responsible for torpedoing the Prime Minister's yacht, uh, also for having Nelson's columns sprayed with plum jam. And that was only the Monday. On Tuesday... Oh, they, uh... splendid, Pitkin, splendid. You've said enough. They're clearly ideal for the job. They must represent us at the conference. They'll return empty-handed, I promise. Everything they touch turns to dust. <laughs> And so we nip down the corridors of power, down, right down, to the General Assistance Department. Here, Lennox Brown and Lamb, with the help of Secretary Mildred, are discussing the financial crisis. It isn't fair, one. Most people have a little money left at the end of the month. I always have a lot of months left at the end of the money. <laughs> Look, old chap, yes. if you're temporarily embarrassed, I'll bend the rules a little. You can take a short-term loan from the petty cash box. I've looked in there, one. There's nothing but two foreign coins, four of your IOUs, and a badge saying, Freak out, fellows, it's Friday. <laughs> Why don't you put in for a rise, Mr Lamb? I can't. I'm only grade M, and we're not due for a rise till 1980. <laughs> it's a blooming shame. It's exploration of the workers, that's what it is. I must say, it's not much of a salary. I mean, eight pounds goes nowhere these days. Often it's all spent at the end of the first week. <laughs> well, we can't have you going without lunch. You can share my prune yoghurt, Mr oh, Lamb. Oh, Mildred, that is kind of you. Well, we've got to help each other, haven't we? Quite right, Mildred. Well done, well done, yes. 
Right, well, I'm off to, uh, off to my club now. I take an early lunch. Mm -hmm. Yes, give me more time for my brandy and cigars. Yeah, you're taking a bit of a chance, aren't you, sir, going off early as this? What's the Gregory sees you? Well, what if he does? Great loudmouthed bully doesn't frighten me. Ah, <laughs> oh, Linux Brown. Off early for lunch. Oh, uh, no, no, sir, bully. Uh, Mr. Gregory. Yeah. <clears throat> no, 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 I, I never go as soon as this, sir. Oh, why not? Hmm? I think you should. Take a long lunch break. What about you, Lamb? Why don't you go off and have a leisurely lunch, too? I can't afford lunch this week, Sir Gregory. Oh, dear me, dear me. We'll have to see about that. Can't have my top executives in financial straits. You're impecunious, eh? No, I'm all right in myself. It's just that <laughs> I haven't any money. Can we help you, Sir Gregory? Yes, I have an important job for you both. Oh, yes? You're to go to Paris next week to represent Britain at the International Space Conference. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sir Gregory, for a moment. It sounded as if you said we were to represent Britain at a conference. <laughs> That's exactly what I did say. You've been selected for... Well, how shall I put it? Uh, your special personal qualifications. You could knock me down with a feather. That's one of them, yes. <laughs> it should relieve your cash problem, Lamb. There'll be plenty of money for expenses. Oh, how absolutely splendid. And uh, you did say Paris, Sir Gregory? I did. Yes, my... Well, it's the best time to go there, too. Well, the best time to go is when you're young. But it'll still have something to offer you. <laughs> what exactly are we to do at the conference, Sir Gregory? Well, you're to put forward reasons why Britain should be allotted parts of the planet Venus when man lands there. I'm sure you'll think of something. The main oh. thing is to handle this with your usual tact and expertise. Yes, yes. Just like the 101 other jobs you've cocked, uh, covered <laughs> in the last few years. Yes, well, now you leave it to us, Sir Gregory. <laughs> that's exactly what I am doing, Lennox yes, Brown. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All the details are in this file. Yes. Will there be much paperwork, Sir Gregory? Well, there's bound to be a certain amount, yes. I was wondering if we could take Miss Murphy. We've always worked as a team. Hmm. Mm, do you speak French, Miss Murphy? No, sir. Uh, uh, do you know Paris at all? No, sir. Good, then take her by all means. <laughs> Ooh, I've never been overseas before. Well, apart from the Isle of Wight. Mildred, the Isle of Wight is not overseas. Well, you try walking there. <laughs> I say this will be fun. Will I be making a speech, Sir Gregory? Certainly, Lamb. That's an essential part of our plan. Mm -hmm. We want you to stand up at the conference and, and say the first thing that comes into your head. <laughs> yes, uh, now, is that wise, Sir Gregory? You see, <laughs> my colleague has no experience of diplomacy, you know. He, he quite upset those visitors from Paris last year. Kept calling them parasites. <laughs> Dear, oh dear. Well, well, they just didn't appreciate our English sense of fun. No. Well, I mustn't hold you up. You'll have a great deal to do before yeah, next week. Yeah, now, sir, remember, yeah. we want you to be yourselves at the conference. Oh, oh, you you do, sir. Just yeah, no, speak and act naturally, yeah, naturally as, as you do always it. do. Yes, yes. indeed. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> Me mum and dad went to France once. Day trip to Boulogne. Did they enjoy it, Mildred? Oh, yeah. But dad drank so much on the boat, mum had to pay duty on him to get him back in the country. <laughs> Still can't understand why Sir Gregory chose us. He obviously feels we have something special, something the others haven't got. Oh, well, that's true, of course. I mean, but it was odd to see him smiling, wasn't it? You know, I mean, he hasn't smiled like that since you trapped your hand in the franking machine. <laughs> well, I feel it's a great honour. Just think, the sort of things we've been doing for Britain, we'll now be doing for the world. A week later, our heroes are almost ready to leave. In the office, Richard Lamb is making a last-minute check. Has he packed all the essentials? I think I've got everything. Mosquito nets, quinine, <laughs> sterile water, packet of tea. One thing that worries me, man, how are we going to manage with the language? Oh, Gracious me, we'll be all right, too. Most of these French chaps speak English. At least the better sort do. Oh, yes. mm. But just to be on the safe side, of course, I'm taking this phrase book, you see? Oh, may I see it? Yes, do. Have a yes. look at that. Uh, simple French phrases for all the things you need. Yes. In the hotel. Mm -hmm. I asked for a room overlooking the public park, the ornamental gardens, the river bank, the statue of Queen Victoria. Must have proper quarters. You have given me a room overlooking the refuse dump, the railway sheds, the knacker's yard, the cemetery, the prison, the septic tank. No idea of town planning these people, you know. Me mum's a bit worried about my going to Paris. My auntie Glad had an experience there. Did she? Mm. This Frenchman came up behind and pinched her in the Tuileries. 
<laughs> uh, I expect he was one of those free Frenchmen. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Now, don't you worry, Mildred. Stay close to me and you'll be all right. Yes. yes. What about our geranium? Will it be all right while we're away? Yes, sir. My boyfriend Bernard's going to come in and water it every day. Is he? Mm-hmm. Well, I hope he doesn't water it the way he did last time. <laughs> Standing on the desk and sloshing it from the fire bucket. Oh. And, uh, Mildred, what about urgent and important phone calls? Oh, that's all right, sir. I told your bookie you're away. Good. Well, as we don't leave for the airport for another hour, we may as well spend the time usefully. Righty ho, sir. A strong cup for me with seven lumps. And Mr. Lamb's weak and milky, as usual. Yes, sir. <laughs> The supping of beverages during office hours is not, of course, confined to the general assistance department. Can I pour you another cup, Pitkin? Oh, I'm not sure that I should, but, well, it's such a good brandy, uh, perhaps I will. You know, I always feel keeping it in the teapot gives it an extra bouquet. It looks better, too, if junior staff come in. Yes, quite. And I, I came up to tell you, Lord Stilton, that my two chaps have arrived in Paris. I just heard. Oh, good, good. I'm absolutely confident, sir, they'll get through the whole week without putting a foot right. I hope so. Well, according to my information, they're running true to form. At London Airport, they got caught up in the luggage chute. <laughs> Lamb ended up with second-class baggage stamped on the seat of his trousers. <laughs> splendid, splendid. And after that, they were found in an aircraft about to take off for Brazil. And as Lennox Brown had jammed the catch of his safety belt, the whole seat had to be removed, with him in it, and placed on the Paris plane. Oh, capital, capital. It seems you've made a shrewd choice, Pitkin. (laughs) It's absolutely vital the conference shouldn't award Britain any part of the planet Venus. Rest assured, Lord Stilton, my two chaps won't even be awarded a key to the men's washroom. (laughs) Come to think of it, they'll look even worse than usual. All the other countries will have sent their best brains. They want to succeed. Well, that's what Sir Gregory thinks. But in Washington... What I don't understand, sir, is why you nominated Hiram J. Searsucker to represent us at the Paris Conference. He always struck me as a no-good bum. I am cognizant of that fact, Senator. I chose Searsucker because he is a bum. We have just one seat at this conference and you put a bum in it? (laughs) Sure, we don't want a part of Venus We can't afford it, but we can't admit that You mean you sent Seersucker because you hope he'll fail I sent Seersucker because I know he'll fail And in the Kremlin, 28A, Red Square, Moscow Who have you sent to represent our great country in Paris, comrade? Hold on to your balalaika, Igor (laughs) I have sent comrade Nikarsov You sent Nikarzov? That, 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 Muchik? That fool who thought a Soviet was a table napkin? <laughs> that idiot who told Mr. Brezhnev he was a red square? That is him. The man who tried to form the Moscow Young Conservatives Club. <laughs> but if you've sent him to Paris, you'll be sent to Siberia. Or worse, to our embassy in Kensington. (laughs) No, Igor, we don't want a part of Venus. We can't afford it. So he is the perfect representative of another vodka. (laughs) Finally, let's see what's happening in China by peeking behind the scenes. Hello, Mr. Wong speaking. Ah, I'm glad to know I have Wong number. (laughs) <laughs> With regard to Paris Conference, you have sent who? Uh, yes, I have done so. Pardon? I have sent who to Paris? Honorable Mr. Who. <laughs> you sent who? But he is our biggest cretin. Knows nothing about space. He thinks moon made of cheese and Mars made of chocolate. <laughs> we do not want planet Venus. Better save our honorable Chinese money. More flight life for honorable Chinese people. (laughs) Thus, there assembles in Paris a collection of idiots unparalleled since... Well, since the last international conference. (laughs) Can our heroes outstupid the competition? 
They've arrived in their Paris hotel and are settling down like the experienced travellers they are. I'm going to complain to the manager. They've given me that tiny little bedroom over there with a bed like a wooden bench. Oh, don't be daft, too. That's not your bedroom, that's the lift. Oh. <laughs> I wondered why people kept coming in and out while I was changing. Oh, here, don't we have to alter our watches now we're on the continent? Alter our watches? Whatever for? Well, it's your continental time, isn't it? Mm. I mean, we have to put our watches backwards or forwards or something, don't we? Oh, some people do. I, I've never believed in falling in with these funny foreign habits. You know. <laughs> no, my watch will remain the same, and I suggest you both do likewise. Quite right, one. Yes. Well, here we are, all set for a splendid week in Paris. <gasps> I am looking forward to it. French food, that lovely squidgy cheese with the soft skin. Uh, what's it called? Uh, and the nightclubs with all those gorgeous showgirls. Uh, come on, Bear. Yes, I believe they do. <laughs> The elegant strollers on the Champs Elysees. Oh, I'm told it's almost as lovely as Oxford Street. Oh, I wish that waiter would hurry up and take our orders. I'm starving. Well, he's giving us time to study the menu, I dare say. Well, he needn't bother. I'm going to have some proper food. None of this French stuff. I wonder if they got beans on toast with chips. Oh. Mildred, please, let us try to be a little more sophisticated. I mean, take advantage of the French cuisine while we have the opportunity. Mm. Will you be having frog's legs, too? Oh, no, thanks. I had frog's legs once, and for days I felt terribly jumpy. <laughs> yes, well, let's have some of these other continental specialities. Do you understand all that French on the menu, sir? Of course, Mildred, yes. I'm rather a gourmet, you know. Oh, my word, yes. <laughs> Here's the waiter now. Uh, will monsieur place his order? Ah, oh, yes, uh, garçon. I think we'll have uh, some of that to start with. You say some of that? But just lightly grilled, of course. Uh, that, monsieur? Yes. Oh, no, 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 no. That is the name of our cabaret star. Uh, <laughs> hmm. Yes, yes, of course it, yes. Now, what I meant was... Uh, Beans on toast with chips all round and a pot of tea for three. Yes, and make sure you boil the water before you boil the water. <laughs> yes, well, I don't suppose he's ever met high-powered delegates like us before him, no? I think he was quite impressed. All the other waiters are looking at us with their mouths open. It does no harm to let them know one's important, Mildred. What should we do this evening, one? Why don't we go to the theatre or something? There's one next door. Oh, I'm not sure that's suitable. I believe there's a girl in the show who does a striptease with eight pigeons. And for an encore, the pigeons take their feathers off. <laughs> oh, disgusting business, yeah. What, uh, <clears throat> what time does it begin? <laughs> And so next day, the delegates assemble for the first session of the conference. It's held in the magnificent Palais de Verité, or Palace of Varieties, which is, of course, situated on the Rue de Remarque. The French don't want any part of Venus either, and have cleverly made sure they won't get any by supplying the chairman, Monsieur Bidet. The chairman must be impartial, so his country is excluded from the bidding. The opening ceremony over, Bidet is flushed with success. <laughs> he takes his seat. Gentlemen, as you will see from the sand-embroidered map of Venus, the planet is divided into clearly defined areas. I now call upon the senior United Kingdom delegate to state his country's claims. Actually, good luck, man. Thank you very much, Monsieur. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, gentlemen, Britain's claims are as follows. It... Two, two, oh. two. I, I've lost the first page of his speech. Oh, I'm so, uh, yeah. uh, Here you are, one. Just here. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Britain's claims are as follows. Three shirts, four hankies, five long... <laughs> <laughs> this isn't my speech, you idiot. It's, it, it's your laundry list or something. Well, don't lose it, one. That's important. Uh, wait a minute. This must be your speech. Uh, I made it into a dart to throw at the Russians. No. Oh. Give it a minute. <clears throat> uh, my apologies, gentlemen. Uh, Britain's claims are extremely modest, so I will be brief and to the point. First, let me say this. And three hours later? Which brings me to my second point. <laughs> now, I know you won't want me to go on at length about this, so I will state it in very few words. And two hours after that? And that is why I have been as brief as possible. <laughs> 
Now, for the moment, I conclude by assuring you that Britain will spare no expense in developing Venus for the benefit of all mankind. Indeed, the government has already set aside seven pounds towards this. <laughs> well, that is Britain's case, gentlemen. I thank you. Oh, well done, man. Oh, that was a very amusing speech. <laughs> it wasn't meant to be amusing, too. Wasn't it? I had my headphones switched to the Japanese translation. <laughs> <laughs> We shall adjourn for ten minutes. Oh, well, uh, ah, here comes Mildred with the refreshments. Here we are, lovely cuppers. Tea for you, Mr. Lennox Brown. Thank you. Beef and lax for Mr. Lamb. Excuse me, if you please. May I introduce myself? I am Hiram J. Searsucker. I'm uh, the United States delegate here, one of their top diplomats. I was the brains behind Pearl Harbor, you know. Blimey, yeah, we got a right one here. Delighted to meet you, Mr. Searsucker. Would you care for a paste sandwich? Oh, thank you. Well, I came over, Mr. Lennox Brown, because I wanted to congratulate you on your brilliant, dynamic speech just now. I wouldn't have called it actually brilliant. <laughs> but, well, perhaps you're right. Well, take it from me, sir. I know a great statesman when I hear one. It's been a great privilege talking to you. What an intelligent man. The Paris Conference have debated all week, the secretaries dutifully keeping minutes and the delegates cheerfully wasting hours. And on the final day, our heroes approach their breakfast in cheerful mood. Morning, too. Morning. Morning, Mildred. Morning, sir. Yes, good morning. Now, have you ordered breakfast yet? Well, no, sir. There seems to be no one about. Uh, odd way to treat important guests. I know we're earlier than usual, but you think the staff would at least make a gesture? Oh, one of the waiters made a gesture. It was through the glass doors. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, voting day today. We must see that we take home a large share of Venus for Britain. It's been a hectic trip, hasn't it? <laughs> oh, I wish we had more time for sightseeing. Fancy, a whole week in Paris and I haven't been to the Louvre once. <laughs> Poor Mr Lamb. Well, never mind. You've got a nice souvenir for your landlady. A vase, isn't it? Yes, Mildred, but I had an awful time in the shop yesterday trying to explain what I wanted. Well, you should have done what I always do. Describe the shape of your hands. I did, but the manager went and brought me his niece. <laughs> oh, dear, now where is that infernal waiter? We'll have to miss breakfast if he doesn't come soon. No sign of that American, Mr. Searsucker. Looks as if he's gone to the conference already. I shouldn't be surprised, you know. He's very on the ball. He seems to admire you, one. Oh, yes, yes. During the week, we've established what might be called a diplomatic alliance. Oh, uh, whatever's that, sir? I give him some of our sandwiches and he lets me borrow his rubber. <laughs> yes, well, that's what diplomacy is all about, you see, Mildred. Oh, yes, bargaining, making deals, personal contact, you see. Yes, I finally got chatting to the chairman last night. Asked my advice before we left. The chairman asked your advice, man? Mm. What about? Well, he asked me the time, actually. The watch had stopped, you see. Oh. But it's a start, you see. Yes, one begins to feel one has the chairman's ear. I say, one, don't you think we'd better get off to the conference? It's nearly ten o'clock. Mm. Oh, good Lord, so it is. Yes, well, we'll have to miss breakfast, that's all. Now, you stay here, Mildred, and see they cross it off the bill. Join us at the conference later. Righty ho, sir. Uh, we'll have to hurry, one. Oh, poor Mr Lamb. He hates working on an empty tummy. Mm. Hope it doesn't rumble during the speeches. Uh, but bonjour, mademoiselle. Oh. Uh, you will be taking your usual crunchy weeks? Oh, yes, please. But you're a bit retarded this morning, aren't you? I mean, my friend's had to go. It's ten o'clock. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, it's only nine o'clock. Right. On the continent, we are an hour behind your English time. Huh? Oh, I told them we should have altered our watches. <laughs> I suppose they never noticed not having had an early start before. Ah, perhaps you would like some French breakfast today, mademoiselle. Do you fancy a roll? Oh, get off, saucy. <laughs> <laughs> Arriving an hour early, our heroes are surprised to find the conference hall empty except for the chairman, Monsieur Bidet, who, having set his watch by Lennox Brown's last night, is an hour early, too. It is most strange. I cannot understand why no one is here. Very odd. It's twenty past ten. Yes. Shall we wait for the other delegates, Mr. Chairman? Or? Certainly not. No. I, I have an urgent appointment at eleven. Uh, a matter which cannot be delayed, though she becomes very angry. Eh? <laughs> no wonder he sleeps through the afternoon. Sir. <laughs> so, let us waste no more time. I now declare this conference in session. We shall begin at once to vote on the allocation of parts of the planet Venus. First, 
this northern area, the sea of irresponsibility. I move that this should be allocated to the United Kingdom. I second that. Those against? None. Very well. Allocated to the United Kingdom by two votes to nil with 56 abstentions. <laughs> Second, the vast central plateau known as the Desert of Apathy. I move that this should be allocated to the United Kingdom. Thank you, gentlemen. I shall now sum up. The conference, having voted on all sections of Venus, are now irrevocably declares the whole planet to be the property of the United Kingdom. I can't wait to see Sir Gregory's face yeah. when we tell him we've got the lot. I will. <laughs> Pitkin speaking. Ah, hello, Lord Stilton. Uh, yes, yes, I'm expecting Lennox Brown and Lambag any minute. What? Oh, don't worry, they'll be empty-handed, all right. Ah, this sounds like them now. <laughs> I'll phone you back when I've heard the whole sorry story. Come. Ah, come in, Lennox Brown, come in, Lamb. Thank you, Hello, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Now then, you two, sit down and relax. Thank I've you brought out a couple of brandies for you. Oh, very kind of you, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, you need a bit of cheering up, I expect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we didn't get any part of Venus, On eh? the contrary, Sir Gregory. We've got the lot, sir. Uh, never mind, never mind. You can't win them all. You were up against stiff competition. But we outsmarted them. We won every vote. The planet Venus is ours. Don't take it to heart, lad. What did you say? Thanks to us, Britain has been allocated the whole planet. No! Yes, Sir Gregory. We, we, it isn't true. It can't be. You're joking, aren't you? <laughs> Tell me it's a joke. Well, I mean, see for yourself, sir. We've got the charter here. Yeah! Oh. You blundering fools, you hopeless nincompoops. Give me back that brandy. You, you bungled everything. Do you mean... Britain doesn't want Venus. Well, of course we don't. We can't afford it. We haven't the cash. Well, that makes two of us. Well, don't you see? You were meant to fail. That's why you were chosen. You know perfectly well we rely on you to let us down. <laughs> but surely, Sir Gregory, Venus can be used for something. Yes, a place for sending sack civil servants. Apart from that, the whole planet is worthless. Just let me get my hands on you. Oh, Sir Gregory, please. No need to be hasty. But throwing that typewriter will hurt it more than us. Don't but... bank on it, Lennox Brown. <laughs> Excuse me, but are you right Sir it. Pitkin? Who the devil are you? I am Hiram J. Seersucker, sir, from the United States of America. Say, that's a pair of smart cookies you got working for you. What? They made history. Yes, sir, they sure hogtied the rest of us at that conference. Well, sir, I don't bear any grudges, and I'm here to buy all rights to the planet Venus off you. You want to buy Venus? I have a U.S. government checkbook right here, sir. Name your price. Ah, yes. Well, you, you must realize Venus is a very valuable property, Mr. Seersucker. Very valuable. But you just said it was worthless, sir. Oh, sorry, lamb. Was that your foot? Um, yes, Mr. Seersucker, we have elaborate plans for developing the planet. Fifty million? Fifty, uh... A million? Say, you drive a hard bargain. A hundred million? You're offering us one hundred million. Oh, very well. Two hundred million? But that's my final offer. Uh, very well, we accept. Here's your check, Sir Pitkin. I'll bring in the documents later, sir. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Just wait till the president hears this. He'll really flip. Yes, I dare say he will. Two hundred million pounds for the exchequer, sir. Well, perhaps we didn't do so badly after all. Well, perhaps you didn't. As we've got all this money, could I have a rise, Sir Gregory? During the last week, I've got rather used to eating. You no, Len, you may not have a rise. How dare you? I was only asking. Well, don't well, have a rise. Right anything. I, I, I only got to in my... In conference, as the men from the ministry were Richard Murdoch and Derek Guyler. Also featured were Norma Ronald, Ronald Baddeley, Garrard Green and John Graham. The script was written by Edward Taylor and John Graham, and the programme was produced by Edward Taylor.
Time to meet the men from the ministry. Join us now as we take our 100th ride on the Whitehall Roundabout with Norma Ronald, Ronald Baddeley, John Graham, guest star Clive Dunn, and the men from the ministry, Richard Murdoch and Derek Guyler. <laughs> ministry men tackle a wide range of jobs and bring to each a degree of enthusiasm not far short of indifference. In the General Assistance Department, top executives are at this moment grappling with the distribution of essential supplies. Now, here you are, old chap. Have a bit of fruitcake. <laughs> oh, you like that, don't you, eh, what? The pigeons don't seem so hungry this morning. I think someone else has been feeding them. Oh, that home office mob, I dare say. Yeah, yeah. They've nothing better to do with their time, you know. Yeah. Now, come along, Oscar. Pick up the crumbs. That's a good boy. <laughs> we don't want a messy window, Sil, do we? Oh, apparently we do. <laughs> Raise a cheer. Tea is here. Ah, oh, Levens is. Thank you, Mildred. Put it on the desk, will you? We're just feeding the pigeons, dear. Yes, yeah, so I see. I hope they appreciate it. Oh, they do. Don't you, Raquel? <laughs> We've given them all names, you see. Oh. Yeah. That one with the puffed-out chest is Raquel. <laughs> this one I've called Oscar. He's rather wild. He has some peculiar habits. <laughs> And you see that shifty-looking one over there on the left? Yes. That's Harold. Yes, well, he likes to sit on the fence. <laughs> but he keeps falling off because he's always trying to face both ways. And this one here is Nemesis. I'm training him to dive-bomb the permanent undersecretary's bowler hat. By the way, sir, Sir Gregory Lang, he'd be dropping in to check on those airport jobs. It's London's new airport, you know. Mm. They're opening it next week. Oh, yes, sir. You know, I still reckon it's daft, though. I mean, building London's fourth airport in the north of Scotland. <laughs> it's the nearest to London they could get it, you see, without upsetting any residents. <laughs> have you done the brochure, sir? I mean, it goes to press tomorrow. Yes, we have, Mildred. How does this sound? The government is proud to announce the opening of London's newest and finest airport at Glen Boggy. Although Scotland is somewhat outside central London, a fleet of coaches will whisk travellers from the airport to the heart of the metropolis in under 24 hours. <laughs> That's very nicely put, sir. Thank you. Oh, I think Sir Gregory will find that everything's in hand when he calls today. Yeah, he won't be able to storm at us and bellyache like he usually does. Now then, I want a word with you. Good morning, Sir Bellyache. I, I mean, uh, the, the good storming, Sir Gre uh, yeah. Now, about the opening of this new airport. Everything is under control, sir. Is that so? Oh. Everything's under control, oh. eh? What about this party for all the VIPs who are flying in on the first planes? What about that, eh? It's all arranged, sir. A marquee's been put up specially for the occasion. Yes, yeah, so I understand. <laughs> A large tent has been erected in the middle of the main runway. <laughs> Can you tell me why? Because it might rain, Sir Gregory. What? <laughs> Pay no attention to my colleague, Sir Gregory. He'll be better when the full moon's past. Ah, yes. no. Now, I'd no idea the tent had been put in the middle of the runway, I assure you. But it's ludicrous. Well, of course it is, sir. Absolutely ludicrous. It'd be far too windy, though. Yes. <laughs> now, we get that marquee book. Well, in future, there'll be less bungling all round. An efficiency expert arrives at the Ministry tomorrow. An efficiency expert? Miss Warboys. Oh, what exactly will she do, Sir Gregory? Miss Warboys yes. will weed out incompetence, inefficiency, and slackness, and that'll be just the beginning. Ah. So watch it. You have been warned. Ooh, uh, I've heard about Miss Warboys. They call her the Beast with Aris Tweed Knickers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I've been uh, thinking of taking some leave, too. You can't manage the airport opening next week. Pity. I'm all right, sir. My leave's already booked. Oh, yes. You're off tonight, aren't you? Mm. You're going to Tar Beach again? That's right, sir. The holiday camp. Mm. But you had a week there last year, and you said the goings-on were disgraceful. Yes, sir. This year we've booked a fortnight. <laughs> Here, I hope you'll be able to manage while I'm away. I mean, making your own tea and everything. I don't think you need worry about that, Mildred. Uh... We're not fools, you know. <laughs> How many spoonfuls of tea should I use one? Uh, well, let's see, there's only two of us, so, uh, wait a minute, um, twelve should do it. <laughs> no, 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 two, D don't huh? push it down the spout. Mm. <laughs> Lift the lid off the kettle and spoon it straight in. <laughs> Sorry, man, 
Uh, perhaps you'd better make it. Yes, very well. Perhaps I'd better. Mm-hmm. Now then, you two. Oh, Sir Gregory, how nice of you to drop in. Lovely weather we've been having. I hope you're keeping well. Oh, stop chattering, Lennox Brown. Lamb, eh? you're not making tea, are you? No, Sir Gregory. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear it. I couldn't manage it, so Mr Lennox Brown's yeah. making it. <laughs> no, be quiet, man. Quiet. Now, this airport business. Some of the installations up there have been tested and found wanting. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, sir. Well, the luggage arrangements, for instance. Oh, dear, you mean they're not working? Well, they're working, but not in the best airport tradition. Oh. As it stands, passengers could collect their luggage immediately after landing. And that's not good? Well, of course it isn't. Passengers expect a long wait. Good for discipline. Also, the system must be amended so that one suitcase in five goes missing or, or is burst open. Yes, I see. Well, we don't want travellers getting fancy ideas or we'll have to change all the other airports. Quite so, yeah. And the loudspeaker system is hopeless. It seems you can hear every word. Dear. Me. Shocks of that kind could upset the public, yeah. Well, we'll have it dealt with at once. Sometime. And you know, of course, there's an inaugural flight from London arriving in time for this party you organised. Oh, yes, yes. And you'll be aboard, will you, sir? Correct. I shall be travelling with a PM, so I shan't be in the office that day. No. Uh, Miss Warboys will be in charge. Yes. Oh, the efficiency expert, sir. Yes, yes. She's arrived, has she, sir? Indeed she has. And she's already making an impact on the department. I suggest you tidy this ghastly office before she calls. We hear she's a bit of a dragon, sir. Yes, I believe she does terrify people at your level. Uh, She doesn't frighten me, of course. Aha, I want a word with you. Uh, 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 Miss Warboys. Well, uh, how nice of you to drop in. Lovely weather we've been having, what? I I hope you're keeping well. Oh, be quiet, man, and stop chattering. Oh, uh... Yes, yes, all right. And don't just stand there with your mouth open, Pitkin. You look as half-baked as these two. You are Lennox Brown and Lamb, I take it? Uh, Yes, yes, yes. My purpose in this department is to look for zeal and proficiency. Oh, you won't find any here, I promise you. (laughs) That will do, Lamb. Be quiet, Pitkin, and do not interrupt. Sorry, sorry, ma'am. Miss uh, Warboys, may we offer you some refreshment? You know, a a cup of tea, perhaps? I'm sure my colleague would be pleased to press you to a sponge cake. (laughs) (laughs) Tea? Most certainly not. I will not have staff indulging in revelry and licentious behaviour. From today, there will be no more tea breaks. Oh, oh, quite right, Miss Warboys. Be firm with them. There's far too much slackness in this department. Indeed, there is, Pitkin. You, for instance, standing around this office like a street corner layabout. Now get back to your desk at once. Oh, yes, yes, ma'am. Certainly. And, yes, and yes. don't let me catch you at your window again, peering at the girls in the typing pool. Really, ma'am, I do no such thing. Uh, that reminds me, Sir Gregory, we've had your binoculars repaired, as you ask. <laughs> oh, no, yes, thank you. Well, uh, goodbye, Miss Warboys. Bye. Now then, you two, I hope I've made myself plain. Uh, very. There's been a great deal of time wasting in this ministry. Mm-hmm. You'll scarcely believe it, but some members of staff actually feed pigeons on the windowsill. Of course. No, you could have to do that. It's dreadful, that. <laughs> exactly. Of course, I realize you wouldn't do that sort of thing here. Oh, you certainly not. <laughs> Here you are, Raquel. You've got a special bumper bundle. <laughs> By Jove, too, are you sure Miss Warboys is out this yes, morning? Yes, I heard it from old Matthews. She's at the civil service training school giving a display of karate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, it's nice to relax. There's a new bird here today. Keeps flying onto my head. Watch out. Might be a woodpecker. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a pigeon, all right. And he's got something tied to his leg. Good Lord, so he has. I believe that's a carrier pigeon. Come here, old chap, and let's have a look at you, will you? Come, come, come on, come on. That's, there you are. Do you see? It is a message. It is. It is it, look, it's addressed to us. So it is. To the General Assistance Department. Who is it from? It says from the observer post on Ben Bogle. Ben Bogle? Ben Bogle. Hmm. Wait, wait a minute. That's a mountain in Scotland. Is it? You remember? Yes. We helped on army postings in the 1940s. Oh. Well, go on, read the message to me. Uh, right. Yeah. Urgent. Please send more corned beef. What? Only a hundred tins left. Last okay. lot supplied, 1944. Baked beans not needed. 
assuring you of continued vigilance in His Majesty's service, Percy Hardstaff Private. Percy Hardstaff Private? Corned beef, 19 foot. What is all this? The message is dated last week. It's on army paper. Extraordinary business. Almost as if there was someone up there who still thinks the war's on. <laughs> that couldn't be. Could there? Well, of course not to. Uh, yet I don't know. I mean, people have blundered in the past, haven't they? You mean someone forgot to discharge him? Well, I suppose it is possible. Here, we'd better get down to records and check. Yes. Let's get this sorted out before Miss Warboys hears about it. Yes. There could have been a mistake, you know. They weren't all that efficient here in the war, at least. <laughs> Not until we arrived. <laughs> yeah. I remember one. It took us months to raise the standard. Yes, well, let's hope Mr. Stack's not gone to lunch yet. Mr. Stack? Mr. Stack of records. Oh. <laughs> Hello. Looks as though he has. No one about. What a dreary place. Just rows and rows of metal drawers. <laughs> What's that? I can hear a noise like snoring, too. So can I. I think it's coming from that filing cabinet. Well, open the drawer. Go on, the one marked S. Uh, right, yes. <laughs> I say, there's a man sleeping inside. I say, that must be Mr. Stack. Do you know, I've heard about him now, come to think of it. Yeah? Yes, if things are quiet, he files himself in a drawer and goes to sleep. <laughs> yeah, go on, wake him up, too. Uh, wake right. him up. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Uh, time to get up, is it? Oh, I'm so sorry to disturb you, old chap, but uh, we have an urgent query, you see. Oh. Army postings. We want to look up a private Percy Hardstaff. Yes. Oh. oh, well, if you wouldn't mind helping me out. Now then, yeah. army postings, yes. other ranks. Well, they're over here. I just have to move my bicycle. Uh, hard stuff, did you say? That's right. Private Percy Hardstaff. Ah, here we are. Hardstaff Percy Private. Same fella. Mm. <laughs> Sent to Observer Post, Summit of Ben Bogle, June 1940. Oh, that's odd. His card's not been stamped. Oh, it's very odd. Well, why should his card have been stamped? Well, to show he was demobilised after the war. <laughs> According to this, he should still be there. Yeah, well, uh, surely not. No, no. It must simply be a paper error. Ah. Oh, there was some pretty shoddy work in those days, you know. Yes, well, that's just what we were saying, Mr. Stack. A lot of old muddlers about, you know. It'll tell us on the back who was responsible for the job. Ah. Oh, yes. Mr. Lennox Brown and Mr. Lamb. Oh, well... <laughs> that explains it. Does it? Yeah, the biggest pair of idiots in the building, I hear. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you know them at all? No, 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 no I've mean, no, never no, heard no, of them. No. Oh, they can't be so daft they forgot to discharge him. No doubt they just didn't bother to stamp his card. Well, excuse me, I'm off to lunch. It's been all go this morning. We'll have to do something about this, too. Now, where exactly is Ben Bogle? There's a map of Scotland on the wall. Oh, let's have a look. Ah. Yes, wait a minute, here it is. It... Oh, good grief. What is it? Well, it, it's just beside Glen Boggy, the new airport. Oh, dear. The place will be swarming with pressmen next week. Oh. If they get hold of this story, they'll murder us. Now, we must get up there at once. Hush this thing up, you know, sort it out quickly. But I can still hardly believe it. Someone up there who still thinks the war's on, can it really be true? <laughs> Good old Vera. Oh, what a lovely voice. Oh, yes. It's one of the nicest voices I've ever heard. I love you, I love you. Oh, those tones. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Vera. Ruddy gramophone. I'm not winding you up again, matey. I've got other things to do. What's that good? Yes, Daisy must have reached London by now. She'll be all right, don't you worry. <coughs> Go there myself? <coughs> Not likely. If I'd turn my back for a minute, them jerry planes would be across this coast in no time. <coughs> What's that, someone coming? <coughs> Blimey, you're right. There's two men coming up our mountain with a big wooden crate. Here, maybe that's the corned beef. <coughs> or they could be jerry spies, Yeah. They're dressed a bit funny for spies, though, aren't they? Mm. Yeah, got bowler hats and black jackets. 
still best, best be on the safe side. I'll put on my tin hat and camouflage and I shall go and intercept them. Now, come on, get out of it. No, come on, get out, Elsie. I want to wear this hat. <laughs> oh, stop fussing, too. Corn beef isn't all that heavy. And if we'd sent this crate by post, the whole thing would have come out. Yes, Ron, but why do I have to carry it? Because I am carrying my umbrella and briefcase. Oh. <laughs> anyway, we're almost there now. Oh, dear me. That must be the observation post. Thank heavens for that. I say, it's got a gun outside. Well, of course it has. These posts were designed to prevent enemy aircraft coming in over the coast. I can't see anyone about. Halt! Who am I? <laughs> Who said that? I think it was that bush over there. Good Lord, it's moving towards us. Oh. Advance and be rectified. <laughs> and put your hands up. This must be hard stuff, too. Best put your hands up. Yeah, yes, right. Oh! Ah, you idiot, you've dropped the corned beef. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, what's that? Corned beef? Did you say corned beef? So you're on our side. You're not two of them. Yeah, I beg your pardon. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, look here. We, we've brought your supplies from London. You see? We are here from the Ministry. God bless you, sir. Hmm? And your Batman. <laughs> Come along into my little pillbox and tell me how the war is going. Well, actually, Mr. Hardstar... Uh, quiet, oh, quiet, quiet, quiet. We've got to break the news gently. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Hardstaff. We'll, um, we'll give you all the news in a moment. So. Yeah, and you get a bit cut off up here, you know. Now then. Yeah. Uh, come in, sir. Make yourselves at home. It's been my home for more than 30 years. Uh, yes, we realise that. And uh, <laughs> I dare say there have been times when you've um, felt rather lonely. Hmm? Lonely, sir? Lonely? Up here on the mountaintop with the cry of the curlew of a morning, the owls hooting of an evening, and my friends the pigeons to talk to all day? Yes, I've been ruddy lonely. <laughs> <laughs> it's all a bit different now, Mr Hardstyle. Well, i tell you something else, sir. You'll get terrible wind up here. It's them baked beans, sir. <laughs> I have them with the corned beef, you see. So yes, yeah. well, we've brought you some rather good news, actually. Oh, Rommel's on the run, is he? Uh, no, 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 no. I said our lads would have him. Uh, yes. I've got some cocoa brewing, sir. No. We'll all have a drop to celebrate. Yes, well, that's very right. kind of I don't think. get many visitors up here, you know. As a matter of fact, you're the first human men I've seen since 1943. <laughs> You haven't seen another human face since 1943? Well, not in the flesh, sir. Of course, I got my little Doris to look at. That's her photo on the shelf, sir. Ah, oh. oh, she's my young lady. She'll be waiting for me when this lot's over down in London. You won't catch her up the pally with the Yanks. Here's your mug of cocoa, oh, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, That's very kind. Uh, that mug's been a good friend of me, sir. Every night for 30 years, I put my teeth in there. LAUGHTER uh. Excuse me, Mr. Hardstuff, but I think they're still in there. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you worry, sir. Spot of cocoa won't harm them. <laughs> now then, tell me about dear old London. <laughs> Hardstuff, you haven't uh, been listening to your wireless lately, have you? Uh? No, sir, not lately, sir, because the batteries went out in 1942, sir. But I got my old gramophone. And, of course, you haven't had television. No, sir, no, I've had very good health, sir, except for touching <laughs> <in. laughs> He doesn't even know what television is. But you, uh, you don't uh, see the newspapers, then? Well, yes, sir, but the boy got fed up delivering. Oh, really? Well, it was six miles up with the morning paper, and he'd no sooner got back than he had to start up again with the evening. <laughs> he chucked it in, he did, you see. Where are you going? I'm going to fetch some corned beef. We'll have a bit of supper, eh? Oh. Now, listen to listen. Yes. One of us has got to tell him the war's over, yes. and there's been an awful mistake. Yes. How are you going to do it? Well, we could... <laughs> Why me? We both forgot him. Well, you're better with words, too, you know. And, and besides, you're my junior. So do it, will you? Oh. Do it. Here we are, then. Nice bit of bully. We have to share the plate with the pigeons, but you won't mind that. There's a war on. <laughs> well, uh, the thing is, Mr Hardstaff, uh, there isn't. Uh, the war's over. It finished in 1945, you see, but we forgot to demob you and we're sorry and please don't be cross. What's that? What's that I hear? The war's over. Yes. Don't talk nonsense. Well, it's true, hard stuff. I mean, now we're good friends with Germany. What? Never. Don't you give me that. I know what you're up to. I can see your little game. You're collaborators, aren't you? Quizzlings. Now, look here. I... I'm not going to look anywhere. But... You want me to desert my post, don't you? Give in to Hitler and let him walk in with his gestapo. 
<laughs> Mr. Churchill said it. And it'll be a long, hard struggle. Please don't wave that banner. It might go off. Well, you better go off first. Go on, clear off. Clear off Look, the pair of you. Go on, better, scram. We'd better humor go on, him, too. You Let's go. go. Come yes. on, let's... You get back to London and tell them there's plenty of us aren't licked yet. Any planes come across this coast, I'll blast them out of the skies. Go on, get off, and don't come back. What are we going to do? Oh, well, let him stew in his own juice for a bit, and then we'll go back with some proof. He could do a lot of damage with that gun, couldn't he? Lucky there aren't any planes about. Just a minute. Yeah? Glenboggy Airport opens tomorrow. Oh, dear. There'll be planes coming right overhead. Oh, I, and there's the PM's inaugural flight at 11. Oh, good Lord, we can't wait. We must sort him out now. Uh, open up, hard stuff, will you? I have something to say to you. Oh, yeah. you changed your mind, have you? You're going to fight for your country after all. I don't like to use physical force on a small man like yourself, Hardstaff, but I'm afraid Mr. Lamb is going to have to. What? <laughs> oh, he is, is he? Right. Oh. Yeah. An arm combat, they call that, you know, because sometimes it tears your arm off. <laughs> that was page 53, fig one. Oh, steady on, Hardstaff. <laughs> Don't you try that on me. All right, you have page 54. <laughs> yeah, that's right, you lie there quietly while I try and remember my knots. Nice stout bit of rope. There'll be a plane over here at 11 tomorrow. Now, you mustn't shoot at it. Oh, so that's it, eh? Carrying some of your jelly friends, is it? Well, they're in for a nasty surprise. <laughs> Pitkin here is just checking on tomorrow's inaugural flight. What? Well, you never know what may come up. No. no I got a few snacks on the flight. Hmm? Oh, nothing much. Caviar, perhaps. A pheasant or two. Haunch of venison and uh, champagne, of course. Yeah. Have you got that? Splendid. Goodbye. Now then, Pitkin. Oh, uh, yeah, Miss Warboys. Why have I not been invited on this inaugural flight to Glen Boggy? Uh, why? Yes. yes. Well, it's a rather uncomfortable aircraft, you know, and there won't be any food or drink, except perhaps uh, a few biscuits. I'm glad to hear it. I wouldn't like this to be an occasion for self-indulgence. No. Is it? And by the way, I'm told Lamb and Lennox Brown put a marked key on the runway. Uh, they did, yes, but I tell them to have it moved. It has been attended to. Good, good. And where are the fools today? I gather they've gone up to Scotland. I imagine they're rather tied up there. How long are you going to keep us trussed up like this? You think yourself lucky you haven't been shot? That's what they used to do to traitors, you know. They were shot... And then imprisoned for life. <laughs> What's the time to? It's five to eleven. Oh, glory, the Prime Minister's plane will be over any minute. Don't try that on me, matey. If it is Mr Churchill, he'll be on a British plane, like a Wellington or a Tiger Moth. <laughs> Halifax. I'm not going to shoot at that, am I? But if it's a foreign plane, I'll have it down in no time. That does it too. He's not going to recognise a comet. Oh, dear. He's getting his ammunition yeah, out. Oh, and look at that box. Look at it. It says, supplied by the General Assistance Department. Oh, oh the irony of it. We supplied those shells back in 1942. Ready? Oh, get this ready? Yes. Uh, now then, I say there is a plane coming, all right. Just to wait till I get my specs on. That'll be yes. the PM's plane, right. man. Right. It's a jerry. Well, it must be. Oh. It's not one of ours. Right, you horrible hands. Come and get it. Oh, this is awful, too. Sitting here helpless while he shoots down the PM's plane. And Sir Gregory's aboard as well. Yes, I suppose there is that to be said about it. <laughs> Time is going a bit fast, ain't he? Well, that won't save you, matey. I got you right in my sights. Now then. Last it hunt, they started using metal aeroplanes. <laughs> I'll have you, you nasty Nazis. Oh, they got away. The ammo's no ruddy good. Here, these shells are blanks. All of them. Blanks? You blooming useless pest. You sent me crates of blank ammunition all those years ago. Oh, dear. That must have been one of the first clangers I dropped. Yeah, well, thank heaven you did, too. Well, yes and no. I've just remembered I was supposed to send live ammunition here and blanks to the training school at Aldershot. <laughs> No wonder so few completed the course. 
And here is the news read by John Curl. Drama today at the opening of London's new airport. The first plane into Glen Boggy, carrying the Prime Minister and other leading figures, narrowly avoided flying into the nearby mountain Ben Bogle. Eyewitnesses said a collision would have occurred had the pilot not been alerted by a warning burst of blank gunfire from the top of the mountain itself. <laughs> A ministry spokesman, Mr. Derek Lennox Brown, later said that because they felt the mountain was a hazard, they had recently installed an observer post there. He himself had assisted in firing the gun, which explained why he still had his fingers crossed. <laughs> At the airport itself, there was a slight hitch in the inaugural luncheon. The marquee was erected in a quiet area, but by some oversight, the tables were set up on the main runway. <laughs> In consequence, the Prime Minister stepped off his plane into a bowl of jelly and custard. He shrugged off the incident, saying he didn't get upset over trifles. Well, there are all the papers, one. Hard staff could be discharged as soon as he returns his army knife and fork. Oh, I have those here, too. Yes, he handed them over when we first got down to London. He's calling this morning, by the way. I wonder how he likes the big city after all this time. Well, very much, I should think, with 30 years back pay to spend. <laughs> He's quite bright, really. The way he finally twigged the war was over when I got that banana from my briefcase. <laughs> well, that's the sort of thing he's missed, too. Did you see him at Euston Station, stuffing himself with fruit and chocolate from the kiosk? <laughs> Pity about the British Rail uniforms, though. He thought they were Nazi paratroops. <laughs> oh, well, there's no doubt about it. He'll be having the time of his life. <laughs> You asked me to drop in. Oh, yes, Mr. Hartstuff. What's it like to be back in London, eh? Oh, awful, sir. My old pub's been turned into a supermarket, whatever that is. And all the traffic, sir. I waited hours for a tram, but it never got through. <laughs> what about the new things? Uh, discotheques, the flyovers, American-style chicken burgers? Oh, I ate them, sir. I went into one of them Disney technicals. <laughs> I was chatting up this bird with the long blonde hair and it turned out to be a fella. Chatting up a bird, Mr Hardstuff? And what about your girlfriend, Doris? Well, that's a trouble, sir. I can't find her. No one knows where she lives anymore. I think she may have gone in the blitz, sir. Oh, dear me. But, I mean, surely London has something to offer you? No, sir, I don't like it. I'm going back to Ben Bogle, sir, to my little pillbox. There's peace and quiet there. I thought you said it was lonely. Yeah, it'll be all right, sir. I bought a new record for my gramophone and plenty of batteries for the wireless. If I just had my little Doris, sir, we'd be smug as a bug in a rug. Now then, you two, I want a word with you. Oh, uh, Miss Warboyers. <laughs> I'm sorry about the tables on the run, May. When I told them to move the marquee, I forgot to tell them to move the furniture in the side, and if I'd known they weren't going to, I'd never have done it. Did you say, war boys? It is! It is! It's me own little Doris Warboys who knitted my balaclava helmet. What? <laughs> Percy Hardstaff. My Percy. Where have you been? I've waited for you all these years. <laughs> oh, Doris, don't cry, don't cry, my little darling there. Come on, blow for Percy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you all about it if you come with me to Scotland, my oh, darling. Oh, Percy, I'll come with you anywhere. Yes, come along, my I've darling. Waited all You've got the years. same lovely old bones, you little darling. Well, would you believe it? I don't think we're needed here, too. Quite right, one. Let's go and have a nice cup of tea. Good luck. <laughs> Topping their ton as the men from the ministry were Richard Murdoch and Derek Guyler. Also featured were Norma Ronald, Ronald Baddeley, John Graham, and guest star Clive Dunn as Percy Hardstaff. The programme was written by Edward Taylor and John Graham and produced by Edward Taylor.